and welcome to another program here from the heart of Vienna. I'm Deborah Pirock and I'd like to thank you for joining me. Today we have a very special guest. He's a physician who speaks six languages, has been a guest professor at uh, universities ranging from Harvard and John Hopkins to Zhao Tong University in Shanghai. And Dr. Georg Zimbruner, I'd like to welcome you to the program. Welcome. You're a specialist in neonatology or pediatrics. Um, and today, of course, in Europe, all across Europe, the number of children is shrinking. Uh, how does that impact your profession? Well, there are still children born, but the number has decreased over the past 10 years significantly. And maybe it's stabilizing now. There is also a difference within Europe. Some countries do have a birth rate which allows the population to remain stable, like France. Mm. And interesting enough, the Nordic countries have a higher birth rate than the countries in the south, like Italy or Spain. So Sweden or, would have more births than Italy? Yes. That's a sort of paradox that yes. the Catholic world in the south where the mother plays such an important role in the family that even later on the son comes back and lives with the mother. In these countries where the women are sort of considered as a person who had to stay at home to take care of children, uh, there, there are fewer children than in countries where the woman goes to work and actually there's a direct relationship the more women are employed in a society, the more children it has. That's ironic. It doesn't it's seem to It's ironic. Work. It's sort of paradox. One yes. would not expect that, but that is shown and, uh, empirically mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. You've worked in many different countries, from the United States to China to Germany to Austria. Did you find, um, what country did you find uh, the most pro-life among them? Is that a difficult question to answer, or are they all just too different to compare? Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer, but I know that the Catholic countries in Europe, like Portugal, Poland, and to some extent Austria, do have the lowest abortion rate in comparison to Eastern European countries who had uh, very high abortion communistic, rates. who have uh, had communistic rules and very high abortion rate. I don't know how it relates mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, other, countries. other countries, but that is the fact. You made the remark, uh, which is rather sad, right before the interview began, that uh, among your six children, uh, one of them is a physician, like yourself, but she's in psychiatry. Yes. And you said in future years, because there's so few children, you think there'll be more of a need for psychiatry than in pediatrics. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but we should not project too negatively into the future, you know. Like the church has always been, always been considered to die out, but it never yes, died yes, out. Yes, Stalin, Marx, Hitler, and, everybody you know, Everyone the thought it will be only a matter of a few decades and then the church is gone. And I believe um, people, even in wealthy countries, will realize again that there is nothing better for a life and nothing is giving more meaning mm -hmm. than children mm -hmm. for whom you are responsible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as my friend says, you know, you invest into children and then you get the dividends, the grandchildren. Which you have as well. Which you have, how many, I have four? as well. We have five. Five grandchildren. And I can see and experience this wonderful love, this unreflected love which is given to me as grandfather. It's a great, wonderful experience nobody should miss. Yes, and without having married, 11 children or 11 beings would not be in this world without you and your wife coming together yes, in the Holy yes, Sacrament of yes. Marriage. And me being a woman, I have to ask, you met your wife in South Africa? Yes, I met my wife, wife in South Africa. We married in South Africa and then moved mm -hmm. to Austria because I didn't see any future for my professional life in apartheid South Africa, mm -hmm. as I was opposing and I had already some difficulties with the superior and uh, other 
Um, Let, uh, yeah, the situation people, with yeah. apartheid. Let's talk about the Catholic Church a little bit in, in South Africa as you experienced it. You said the church was very strong against apartheid, which is something I think a lot of people don't know. Yes. The hallmark of the Roman Catholic Church in South Africa was that it was absolutely and adamantly against apartheid. In every Catholic Church, black and white people could worship God next to each other Together. in the same bench. And there was no segregation into groups who were black who had an extra location for mm -hmm. the Mass mm -hmm. and the white people had the Mass in the church. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that was a very important experience for me that the Catholic Church did not give in in comparison to some um, derivatives of the Protestantic Church, mm -hmm. like the National Gereformierde um, mm -hmm. Kerk, or the Reformed Church mm -hmm. of South Africa, was a partner of the government. Oh my. It even supported apartheid, of course, on the false pretenses, you mm -hmm. know, they need their own cultural development and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. and, um, they even found some arguments in the Bible that the people should live separated. You said because they talk about black they sheep and white sheep. They talked about black and white sheep. That's Maybe ridiculous. that's a little coarse yeah, in yeah, the that's notion, tough. but um, definitely they were always for the government, supporting the government, and even the brother of the Premier Minister was the head of that church. Oh my, okay. So. That made a big difference. You said they used to put the blacks in the garage. They weren't even allowed in the church. Yes, to there celebrate. was Not mass, separation and segregation service. between the races were everywhere except where they were needed. There was oh. no apartheid in the homes because all the black people worked there oh. uh, as cleaning woman, as uh, nurse or for whatever. the children. Right, right, right. Apartheid was only when it came to distributing wealth or access. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, everything was segregated. Uh, even in the hospital we had, of course, separate the rooms, operating rooms for the blacks and for the whites, separate uh, wards for blacks and whites. This must have been difficult for you too. As the a white physician. students could go to both oh, okay. wards, but the black students could only go to black wards. The nurses, and doctors were paid only half for the same same work, uh, same uh, level of skill, mm -hmm. and for the same work. Ah, oh, that's crazy. And uh, that was a very unjust, unjust society. And you know, you cannot imagine how radically this segregation was um, kept up. Even stairways were separated in. Oh my uh, white and non-whites. Trains were separated, parking areas, of course, swimming pools, beaches, everything was at that time separate. separated. You worked uh, over the years in neonatology, yes. uh, uh, if you want to specialize specifically respiratory and neurological issues in newborns. Um, obviously, as a physician, you don't differentiate based on sex or based on no. race or based on faith? No. 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 And even in South Africa, coming back to that point, the first areas where they scratched apartheid was in the hospital in pediatric wards because they thought children wouldn't mind to lie next to a black child. Oh, thank goodness for that. And yeah. the other was intensive care because they were so sick that they, they could didn't know not better. They couldn't care complain. about yeah. uh, anyone to them who was not white. Let's go back to your childhood a little bit. You were raised by a single mother. Um, you were an only child? No, I have a half brother. You have a half brother, but you still had a very strong father figure in your family. He was a, a priest, a Salesian priest, yes. and missionary to South Africa, yes. which I assume is how you got interested in South Africa. Yes, exactly. Uh, my uncle, who was a priest, a Salesian priest, and a missionary in South Africa, played quite a significant role for my life. Because when I was five years old, he came for a first home visit mm -hmm. 
to a small town in Upper Austria and to my surprise the fast train which never stopped at that small town for the occasion of welcoming my uncle stopped and there were honoraries here and of course all uh, That's brass, how much they honored a Catholic brass priest band in those music. days. Exactly and that was a time where more than 90% of Austrian population were Catholics. And when you say Catholics, you also mean practicing Catholics. Largely practicing Catholics, but also mixed with traditional, mm -hmm. you know, attitudes. And today that's dropped by about 30%, it's today now 61%. Today we have about 61%, and not only that, mm -hmm. the Catholicism in public is no longer really present as a strong force. In you fact, it's attacked. You mentioned it, it, that you're hosting a it's, lecture it's series. It's a very yeah. popular thing to bash on the Catholic Church or on churches in religion in general. For instance, you're hosting and directing this lecture series. Yes, I, am, I have initiated and I'm running a lecture series which was meant to complement the worldly programs with a more spiritual a program, a lecture series on Christianity. This for the Medical uh, University of Vienna? For that reason it was called Christianity in the General Hospital, but then the medical curricular body said, no, no, that's not possible. You cannot have Christianity as a sole term. You must at least add other religions. So I gave in and said, okay, mm -hmm, let's mm -hmm. call it Christianity and other religions. But they still weren't happy. And they still were not happy. They scratched the title completely from the term Christianity. Now it's called religions in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I accept it because I have access to a lecture hall for free. And mm -hmm. we have... And you can still bring in the speakers Bring in all the people I want to lecture on spiritual things, on religious things, on other issues. And we always have... Uh, 80 to 100 participants, and this is amidst the General Hospital, which has uh, 9,000 employees oh and 2,000 patients. Uh -huh. So it's a very central place, it's amidst the world. That was the idea. Yes, and Viennese medicine is, is also very well known. So. Well, it was well known. It was well known. It's yeah. gone. It's gone now. Tell me about your tie, which yes. says what looks like Hippocrates in German. Yes. My tie has a name on it, mm -hmm. which is Hippocrates, and this is an acronym for a program, actually. It says International Postgraduate Organization for Knowledge Transfer, Research, and, that's why it's a small a, and Teaching Excellent Students. And this was initiated about 34 years ago in our farmhouse, my wife and I had children running around and famous... And you weren't busy enough, so you started no, was an organization. Not busy enough. Uh, professors from the U.S. came to teach in our courtyard because mm -hmm. we didn't have a real lecture room. But the idea took on to have top professors for a small group in a very relaxed environment. And it spread from Austria to many factories, all countries in Europe, and then also to India, Asia, and Arabic countries. And you said there's a seminar now every two weeks? Yeah, we have about 25 seminars a year. That means if you have 50 weeks, every second week about is That's a seminar. We just had one in China, in Chengzhou, and one in Athens. And what were they about? Were they medical seminars? They're, they're, they're all medical seminars. They're all mainly uh, focusing on neonatal issues as I, as founder, was a neonatologist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's mainly neonatology or pediatrics. We were also talking about your, um, your Salesian uncle and you said you were very impressed as a young man or as a boy maybe even that he was a very masculine person. Some people think uh, erroneously that the priesthood, there's something feminine about it and he was a hunter and he was a tennis no. player and very athletic and um, it made a positive impression on you. In my youth, the world was very homogeneously structured. Mm -hmm. Church and priesthood meant to be a male mm -hmm. of course, profession. Yeah. But my uncle was a, certainly a very devoted priest, 
but at the same time he was a man who lived in this world, who enjoyed all the pleasures of daily life, who was a sportsman. He even won the uh, tennis championship on the ocean steamer. He was a hunter. He uh, actually brought along a leopard skin which he had shot himself in the Kalahari Desert. He told the most amazing stories. And for me, this attitude of a clergyman who is fully integrated into this world was a paradigm I have kept up to now. And I believe it's just very important for a Catholic to be that universal and open to all uh, ideas, and directions. You don't of separate thoughts. your personal or your professional life from Catholicism. No, I never did. Even as doctor and as head of the clinic, I was always clear that I believed in God when I spoke to parents and to colleagues and never made any sort of uh, differentiation. Differentiation. I never concealed my belief. I also like your mother sent you to um, a Salesian boarding school. Uh, and it's, I misunderstood this at first, which is why I want to stress it. She sent you to a Salesian boarding school where almost everyone in the boarding school became a priest. Now, this wasn't the school itself. It was just no, it where was you the boarding school. Boarded. It was the boarding house. The boarding house, we should yes. say. And it influenced your Catholicism in a very strong way. I mean, it was only when I entered in 1955 that a large number of the class became priests, but it dwindled very quickly. Something like 8 out of 12 or something. Yes, yeah. 8 out of 12 of that they were different times uh, then, matric yeah. class were becoming priests, but it decreased very rapidly. This uh, Salesian Catholic uh, boarding house um, sort of was very strict. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Morally, one was not uh, supposed to meet girls and kissing would have been considered very inappropriate, even maybe sinful at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. We had no notion of homosexuality or transsexuality. Nobody talked about, Nobody the talked about, about that. But it was at the same time open to um, spiritual things. We had a great library, we had also performances of theatres, mm -hmm. We had great sports events and even I was allowed to attend lectures of a Buddhist who came to town. So I was very happy to have this spiritual background by the Salesian priests. And also there was quite confrontational activities. For example, we had to go to Mass every morning. And you were a little bit of a troublemaker and as a boy. I was <laughs> of the opinion that this was not appropriate. This was against the value of a mass which should be attended Voluntary. voluntarily. And I founded a small party, sort of say, to oppose that, visiting mass every morning by order. And so they finally, not they very long after that, agreed, abolished it. And then you started and, going and to daily I mass. I went still every day. Yeah. So it wasn't this that was, you were anti-church. This was yeah. a sort of behavior which I repeated several times in my life. Like when I was a university student, I lived in a student house mm -hmm. where female visitors were not allowed under the argument that this was a Catholic student house. And I thought this was totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. It was totally unfair and unjust. So I organized with colleagues um, a sort of um, invasion of this student <laughs> house with 500 female students. Mm. And not so long after that, they changed also the rules and built even a student house for female for students next yeah. door and even And it's also important to stress it was a very transitional time. It's not like today where if women were storming a boarding house, it's because they want to live in the same room with men or no, something. No, it was no, nothing no. like that. No, it was just for the pure idea that we are human beings mm -hmm. which want to meet. Mm -hmm. Nobody was filled with the idea of having sex to make uh, a student house where free sex was possible. No. Nobody it, did it, that. It was days, at yeah. that time still 
a spiritual platonic relationship to girls, most of the students had that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for a long time you were at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. We've talked about that and about the way the church witnessed against it. You said the, the government actually, was it the government that called it a quote Roman danger? Meaning yes. the Roman Catholics were a yes. danger to apartheid? Yes. That was the general notion that the Roman Catholic Church was the Roman danger. Just like Hitler, Stalin, everyone, sort of, they knew the church they was... They knew the church was holding against apartheid and adamantly opposed it, mm -hmm. actively opposed it. Mm -hmm. I have already mentioned before that many Catholic missionaries opposed apartheid in various ways. They, for example, purchased all economic uh, enterprises in a town, like electricity, uh, the, the hospital, hospital, the diary, butcher, and other things. Mm -hmm. And any time the government said, you must close your school because you have black and white scholars in your school, amidst the white area, they said, fine, you can reckon that tomorrow you have no electricity, no milk, no et cetera, hospital, no whatever, hospital or whatever, unless you integrate. Unless so the church you concede, played hardball. The church played hardball. The church played hardball, yes. Good for them. Yes. Good for them. Um, later in your life, you had two events which affected you deeply where you nearly died. Once was of cancer yes. and once was of a brain hemorrhage. Tell yes. me about that. This was a time and this was an experience where my belief in God was strengthened very, very much. When I heard that I had cancer, I actually went to the church and I prospectively entrusted my life to God and I said, it's your will and it's your Thy will, be done, yeah. will which will be done and I just entrust myself into your hands. And my wife could not believe that I was tolerating all these procedures of operation and so on so well. I was not angry, I was actually at peace, which was, which peace only from my from biography, yeah. <laughs> seems very unlikely at that stage. <laughs> Yes. yes, and then the brain hemorrhage too. And then I had brain hemorrhage and now every day I am grateful to God that I turned out again completely healthy because two-thirds of patients good. who have such a brain hemorrhage die, die and from those who survive, this one-third, two-thirds of them have severe handicaps. Wow. And I am completely free of all handicaps when I did special tests after the brain injury, mm -hmm. I was even better than my age group, younger than me. Well, you said your grandchildren keep you fit, and but my this grandchildren is still amazing. Keep yeah. me very fit, and, <laughs> uh, and studying, of course, was one of my great decisions in my life. That when I ended my professorship at the University of Innsbruck on February the twenty-eighth, two thousand and nine. Next morning, March the 1st, I went to university, enrolled as a student, and went to my first theology lecture on the Old Testament, and he was talking about God being furious, and he wanted to be the only God, and that was a change in paradigm. It was like entering a new universe. Yes. From 40 years of um, being a scientist, natural scientist, a purist in research, to switch over to a new field, theology. Mm -hmm. And I think it was one of the real wonderful, great decisions I made. And I have completed my studies and I'm now writing up my thesis on the beginning of human existence. You're going for your doctorate in theology yes, now, too. Yes, biological, medical contributions to a philosophical, theological anthropology of prenatal, peri- and immediate postnatal period. 
So the message of that doctorate uh, work is that man is laid ground before birth and maybe the first two years after birth. Mm -hmm. But then he is sort of laid ground and the rest of his life he has either to accept what was given to him, he has to relate to what has been given to him. He can relate to it in a way that he says it is a gift of God. Or not. I, I, or not. I was made like this. Mm -hmm. I accept this as a grace. Or I reject that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in reality, of course, man has still the possibility to alter his way of life. The whole New Testament speaks about being reborn, turn around, change your life. It's never too late. It's never too late, you can always restart. And I mean, this is the key message of Christianity. That and the you, church. And the, the church. church. Um, and I think this is a very central topic to everybody in our society, in our world. Dr. Georg Zimbrunner, I have to end it there. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank you so much. Uh, doctor, of, a physician and doctor of theology, uh, almost. And almost. Uh, father of six, grandfather of five. It's been such a pleasure meeting you. And I want to wish you good luck with, uh, with your doctorate and with your work because I can tell you're going to work until you drop. So. That's a, that's, that's, be, that's a beautiful witness to the faith. And thank yes. you two for joining me for another episode of programming from the heart of Austria here in Vienna near St. Stephen's Cathedral. Bye-bye.